Hello, and welcome to Flying Failures, where we'll be looking at the Whitman Lewis XN BL 1, better known as the Barling Bomber. The Barling Bomber was an early attempt to create a long range heavy bomber for the United States, and would go on to be the largest plane ever built at the time. However, as ambition outweighed practicality, any early support for the bomber soon dissolved, but its legacy would help drive the development of future strategic bombers that would become the mainstay of American air power. The history of the Barling bomber takes its name from its creator, Walter H. Barling, a British aircraft designer who had previously experimented with large triplane bombers like the Tarrant Tabor, which was built in May 1919 for the Royal Aircraft Establishment. The Tabor, however, met a quick demise when it was found to be so heavy and unbalanced it nosed over during the takeoff roll of its maiden flight, crushing the cockpit and killing the test pilots. While the Tabor was a catastrophic failure, its general design principles caught the attention of US Army Air Service General William Billy Mitchell, who was impressed by the basic concept. Mitchell believed that the future of aerial warfare was through the development of large strategic bombers that could carry high payloads in order to sink battleships, and thus used Barling's proposal to acquire a generous government budget. Approaching Barling, Mitchell brought him to the United States in 1920, and approved the development of two prototypes that followed the same design underpinnings as the Tabor, both of which would be designated the Experimental Night Bomber Long Range, XNBL-1. Construction of the planes was to be done at the Whitman Lewis Company of Teterboro, New Jersey, who were also contracted to manufacture the plane's components, with the stipulation that war surplus Liberty engines were to be used. The parts were delivered by train from New Jersey to the U.S. Army Engineering Division at McCook Field near Dayton, Ohio, where the planes were actually assembled. This system of construction, though, presented a logistical nightmare, as the manufacturing of parts and the assembly of the aircraft themselves took place 400 miles away from each other. This disconnect also meant that those building the components didn't know the exact specifications of the parts they were manufacturing, and so they would arrive in Dayton after several days on a train, only to find they didn't fit in their respective places on the airframe. Also, after it was discovered that the fabric wings had trapped rainwater that distorted their initial weight and balance measurements, a large hangar was built at the Wilbur Wright Field in order to allow construction to continue without weather causing trouble, but this came at a cost of $700,000, or $9 million in 2020. As Barling oversaw the gradual assembly of his new aircraft, Mitchell drummed up support for both himself and the concept of large strategic bombers through a demonstration of increasingly powerful bomb designs. In July 1921, a series of trials were undertaken off Cape Henry in Virginia, where the former German battleship, SMS Ostfriesland, which had been ceded to the United States as war reparations, was sunk by a series of continuous aerial bombardments, starting with 230-pound bombs that did superficial damage, before finishing off the vessel with 2,000-pound bombs. The destruction of the Ostfriesland caused a national stir, and made Mitchell a hero of aviation, though the use of 2,000-pound bombs hadn't been sanctioned by the US Navy, and thus drew criticism. Regardless, in spite of the tests being a huge success, Kansas Congressman Daniel R. Anthony made public the fact that the cost of the Barling bomber development had jumped from $375,000 to $525,000, with Congress cancelling development of the project and the building of a second prototype. Come 1923, the first prototype was now nearing completion, and the sheer size of the aircraft, the largest heavier-than-air bomber of that period, captured the public's imagination. The aircraft was 65 feet long and had a wingspan of 120 feet, equivalent to that of the Boeing 737 MAX series of jet airliners. Powered by six 420-horsepower Liberty 12A liquid-cooled engines, four tractors and two pushers mounted behind the two inboard tractor engines, it had a maximum speed of 61 miles an hour and a range of 170 miles, while also capable of flying at a service ceiling of 7,725 feet. In terms of armament, the aircraft featured seven defensive 30 caliber machine guns 
and could carry up to a 5,000 pound bomb load. Operation of the aircraft would consist of six crew, two pilots in an open cockpit in the nose and a flight engineer seated behind them, with separate compartments for a navigator and radio operator, and a bombardier positioned on a small bicycle seat in the lower nose under the pilots. As there was no direct means of communication between the pilots and the bombardier, they would have to send requests for course or speed changes to the cockpit via a pulley and rope assembly. The main cockpit had a single control wheel and one throttle lever for all six engines that the pilot pushed forward or side to side to control the engine speeds for taxiing or to assist in making turns in the air. The landing gear consisted of an unusual 10-wheel adjustable arrangement with oleo struts to distribute the plane's weight on the ground, a pioneering concept that is now commonplace on some of today's larger aircraft. To avoid repeating the fatal crash of the Tarrant Tabor, Dual wheels under the nose helped keep it from pitching too far forward during takeoff, and other futuristic features included reinforced bulkheads and special materials in the fuselage to help protect the plane and crew from anti aircraft fire. The Barling bomber eventually lined up for its maiden flight on August 22, 1923, with test pilots Lieutenants Harold R. Harris and Muir S. Fairchild at the helm, accompanied by civilian flight engineer Douglas Culver and Barling himself. Lining up on the runway at right field, the aircraft climbed skyward after a takeoff run of only 13 seconds and 960 feet. The flight lasted 28 minutes and reached an altitude of 2,000 feet. Throughout the remainder of 1923 and into 1924, Harrison Fairchild flew the bomber to a variety of air shows in Midwest America, including the international air meets in St. Louis. The bomber had significant enthusiasm behind it, and wherever it flew it garnered widespread attention and praise by the public. On October 3rd, 1924, the aircraft set a duration record of 1 hour and 47 minutes for an aircraft carrying 8,820 pounds of payload while flying at an altitude of 4,470 feet. However, behind the scenes, the aircraft was severely flawed. While it could carry significant payloads, the plane was woefully underpowered, due largely to the gigantic and complex structure of the airframe creating such drag that the six Liberty engines struggled to compensate. This issue also negated its role as a long-distance bomber, as due to the weight and drag concerns, the fuel tanks would be expended after only 170 miles. By comparison, the short-range Martin MBS-1 had a range of about 450 miles and could carry a 2,000 pound payload at the same speed. The aircraft's shortcomings were highlighted embarrassingly in 1925, when the bomber was scheduled to make an appearance at an air show in Washington DC, but while en route from Dayton to Washington, the aircraft wasn't able to fly over the Appalachian Mountains with a full load of fuel, and was eventually forced to turn back. After being defeated by a 3,000 foot mountain, the Barling Bomber program quickly fell apart. Aside from cost overruns and the continued issues of performance, the final nail in the coffin was the court-martialing of Mitchell in 1925 for his criticisms against the Army and Navy leadership for investing in battleships rather than aircraft carriers, after which he resigned from the service. Without Mitchell's support, the Barling Bomber project soon ended and it was grounded in 1925 before being dismantled and stored in a warehouse at the Fairfield Depot. In 1929, the new depot commander, Major Henry H. Arnold, discovered the remains of the Barling bomber and, out of sheer embarrassment over the project, had the parts burned, with only two wheels from its revolutionary landing gear being preserved at the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force at Wright-Patterson in Ohio. In the wake of the Barling bomber, both Mitchell and Arnold expressed that they had been somewhat overenthused by the unique potential of the bomber, despite the high cost and lack of performance. Following his court-martial, Mitchell continued to preach the power of aerial combat to all and sundry, but his departure from the service meant his ability to influence government policy was lost. Eventually, he passed away in February 1936, after contracting an extreme case of influenza. Barling, meanwhile, continued to design aircraft, including the Nicholas Beasley MB3 trainer, before finally passing away in April 1965. 
Regardless, both Mitchell and Barling would have the last laugh when concerning the future of aviation and its role in warfare. As predicted, the rise of air power meant that conventional surface vessels and warships were soon vulnerable to sustained aerial attack, with World War II proving this time and again as mighty battleships such as the Tirpitz, the Yamato, the Prince of Wales, and the Arizona would all be sent to the bottom by aircraft. As for the Barling bomber itself, many of the pioneering design aspects of this giant but flawed aircraft were incorporated into later generations of bombers, ultimately leading to the USA's aerial supremacy and the influence it holds today. Thanks again for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, why not leave a like, and be sure to subscribe for more great content. Thank you very much, take care, and I'll see you next time.